Carlo, how is Carlo? How is Carlo COVID? Me? Yes, how is COVID doing in in Italy? Well, the situation is uh, rather under control compared to other um, European countries, in particular neighboring countries like uh, Spain and France, uh, who are much worse. We still have um, a few cases per day, around below 2,000 on a population of 60 million. A very small number of uh, deaths, uh, between 10 and 20. Uh, what is worrying now is uh, what will be the consequences of having uh, restarted the schools. Uh, but this happened already two weeks ago. And apparently there are some uh, negative uh, consequences here and there, but rather limited. So people in general are still rather disciplined, although the situation must be taken seriously. And what is really worrying is that we are surrounded by countries. We're going to start the webinar now. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Hanin Esbez, and I'm I am the coordinator for the task force four. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the fourth webinar for the T20 summit season. Uh, first, I would like to invite the lead co-chair of our task force four, Dr. Uh, Suzanne Al-Qurashi, uh, to give the welcome remarks. Uh, floor is yours, Dr. In the name of Allah, the most gracious and most merciful, good afternoon. I would like to begin by congratulating the custodian of the two holy mosques, His Royal Highness King Salman bin Abdul Aziz and His Royal Highness Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman on the presidency of G20 2020 and for bringing Saudi Arabia to the forefront of a global leadership. Under the direction of King Salman and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, Saudi Arabia has grown dramatically in many fields. Development of Saudi youth and empowerment of women and building a unified community with common goals. I would like to welcome Dr. Fahad al Turki, chair of Think Tank Saudi, and we are honored to have Kalu Sashi Saki. Carlo Sacchi, Vice President of Italian Host uh, of Italian uh, Institute for International Political Studies, also the Task Force for Co-Host Argentine Council for International Relations, represented by Consular Pablo Ava, my respected fellow, co-chairs, author, respected <coughs> colleagues, and representatives of G20 nations, joining in the concluding webinar of Task Force 4 on social cohesion and the state. Nearly a year ago, I was given the privilege of leading the Task Force 4. In the invitation carried with it an onerous sense of responsibility. The gravity of the implications, these policy contributions can have are both desiring and rewarding. I accepted the task as my patriotic duty and a chance to serve my homeland, Saudi Arabia, and humanity. The Saudi Arabia makes it historic debut presiding over G20 summit. You see, accepting to be the lead co-chair was the easy part. Ten, month, ten months later, Task Force 4 has not only finalized, but published the final policy briefs, a journey that started with four prospective abstracts, 
tendered by over 114 authors from every corner of the world that began a massive task finding the policies that match the task force objectives, practical and make a difference in the socio-political sphere around the world. The abstracts went through several review, process, revision, editing, reformulating before being published. Bringing a successful policy to the table requires building a cohesive bond within team along with the co-chairs and the T20 secretariat reviewers. Success in, is inevitable when individuals can bond and create cohesive groups with shared goals. As with all journeys, ours was also hit by a storm that continues to date and will carry forward into the near future. With the accelerating spread of COVID-19, in addition to the mounting mortality rates, gave rise to diminishing socioeconomic conditions coupled with loss of faith, of faith in the machinery of, stay, of the state in both developed and developing nations. The continuing pandemic further hammered down in all aspects of society. Now, with its uh, repercussions, to be faced for more years to come. This was a turning point in the de de development of a policy brief as the task force had to reassess the immediate needs accordingly shifted to direction of a policy briefs to take in account the devastations caused by the global crisis. I loud the authors who took the task in stride and proposed development, developmental strategies needed to elevate the effects the pandemic is having on civil society. Task Force on Social Cohesion and States hope to have contributed even nominally towards the G20 leaders' decision-making that would lead to reducing disparities and empowering the mar uh, margin uh, mar uh, marginalized citizens. Task Force Four policy briefs address these concerns. The policies on economy call for a universal income to battle economic inequalities and assuring everyone basic needs are met. We call for more transparency in tax expenditure while increasing in investments in future human sets uplifting the socio uh, socioeconomic status of future citizen by investing in early childhood education and care programs to improve labor rights of female workers in care chains g20 governments is asked to apply stricter legalization procedures for migrants workers and fair wages more importantly empowering local governments to exercise a greater control and accountability of their states or provinces we ask g20 nation to join f to join efforts against current and future crisis in the world of in the words of bertrand russell social cohesion is necessary and i will add to it that not only it is a necessity, but be vital in ensuring continued existence of the states. A cohesive state and society enables its citizen to participate in public and private initiatives freely wanted in, uh, in securing financial independency, encourage, encourages social mobility, work to mitigate socio-economic disparity and styles a sense of oneness for common causes while encouraging individuality or re, uh, re, uh, respective cultures and beliefs. Establishing and maintaining a cohesive society is a sizable task that encompasses education, 
governance, dignity of work and culture with a shared vision of the nation. Cohesion is the need of the, of the moment at local, national, and global scale. I urge the G20 leaders to create alliances in, in, to ensure a secure future for the generation to, uh, for the generation yet to come, but to whom we already owe heavily. We owe them a secure world, a world where, where, where there will be no more discriminations on basis of gender, race, ethnicity, economical opportunity, and education. In the end, I will take the opportunity to congratulate the T20 Chair, King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center, Kapsar, King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies, Kafasars, and the team of T20 and G20, whom despite many obstacles have managed to keep all the review, process, events, meetings, and the summit running in a timely fashion and with no changes in the schedule with transitioning to online platform in a short notice. I am grateful to my co-chairs, coordinators, and authors for their diligences to, in supporting the task force for objectives through their policy briefs. And as we come close to the end of a year of hard work, I wish the best to our Italian counterparts, success in their presidency of G2021. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Suzanne, for this uh, comprehensive remarks. Uh, now, I uh, would like to, uh, to welcome uh, uh, the co-host, Pablo Ava, uh, the Consular at Argentina Council for International Relations, uh, to give the opening uh, re uh, keynote. Um, floor, to, uh, floor to yours, Pablo. Could you please open your mic? In behalf of the Argentinian Council of International Relations and its president, Dr. Rodriguez Javarini, I would like to thank Saudi Arabia 220 for the invitation to co-host this meeting. We are very proud to do it. Thanks to Karsak, to Vice President Fahad al Turki and to Susan Al-Korashi for the introduction. Uh, next, please. Um, thank you so much. Next. I would like to set at the beginning three statements on social cohesion. First of all, social cohesion is a concept that qualifies society for the interdependence on social network. This interdependence changed from one society to other society. The interdependence also changed from time to time in the same society. Change. Emil Durheim in 1897, used the concept for the first time. Change. For him, social cohesion depends on two conditions. The first one is the absence of social conflicts. This is not, not to have conflicts on wealth, ethnicity, race, or gender. And the second condition it is the presence of strong uh, bonds, civic society, responsive democracy, and impartial law enforcement. Next. The general idea behind the concept of social cohesion is that brings people together around a common purpose with trust and confidence in each other. 
So it can be said that social cohesion is the density of the society network. Next. The second statement on social cohesion is actually a problem. If there is a density on societies, there should be a method to measure it. Next, about to measure, to measure things, mankind since ever, next, want to measure things. Measure distance, longer distance, measure size, next, measure weight, the speed of a ship, and the population through census, through census to use it for collect taxes. Next, then at the modern era, society start to measure life, life expectancy, mortality, male-female ratio, marriage, maternal mortality, and some other figure, figures related to health. Next. Michel Foucault uh, say that this is very a moment of the biostatistics is so important that becomes the milestone of the beginning of the modernity. So the birth of the modern state, the beginning of a public policy as we know it now. For Foucault, law and sovereignty are, is being set away and replaced by normalization based on the statistics. So that became the new power of government and politics. He called that biopolitics or biopower. That was a concept uh, created in 1916 by Kellen, the same thinker that creates the concept of geopolitics. But people, and we, we went further. We tried to measure the wellness of society, GDP per capita. Me, me, uh, tried to measure people's happiness human development, economic expectations, inequality by the Gini index, equality of education. Next. We can keep talking for hours about different types of measures dedicated to society and social cohesion is one of them. In fact, there have been many ways to measure social cohesion since 1897, since Durkheim. We found at least 24 methods to uh, try to, to measure social cohesion, 24 methods and 24 concepts, different concepts. Next. The problem, as you see, is there is not consensus on one single methodology, not even on a single concept. Next. There's only consensus on that social cohesion has three main components, social capital, social inclusion, and social mobility. These three issues are the components of social cohesion. Next. From this, uh, from this concept, uh, there has been many types of be of view on the of the social cohesion definition. If you see in the vertical horizontal axis, it's the one that relates people with other people with equals. So we can see from there the measure of trust, accept of diversity, and confidence. But also there's a vertical way to see social cohesion and relates people with institution, with leaders, with perception of fairness in society. And if you see it in from the objective composition, we move from uh, public opinion or opinion to hard data uh, information like uh, community work, civil participation, political participation. Next. Today, there are three main social cohesion research. Uh, one of them is run by Eurostat, the European uh, Union Statistic Organization. The second one is running by the Economic Commission for Latin American and the Caribbean, 
with the support of the United Nations. And there's a third uh, main social cohesion study run by the OCD. And this is having very strong development and is, is run in many different countries. So next. There are also three methods challenge on uh, measuring social cohesion. One of them is the method challenge from that comes from technology and social cohesion. We are facing the 2.0 era and social networks, data mining and big data analysis moves and challenge social cohesion measures how social network impact on social cohesions. Are we closest one, closer one to each other or, or, or are we isolated by technology? Data mining, machine learning, artificial intelligence can measure with a higher precision this impact on society. Next. What we can say for sure that the technology change at least the form of the social cohesion density. Next. The second challenge have to do with COVID-19 uh, pandemia. It is paradoxical that COVID-19 pandemia policies seems to reverse the direction of social cohesion. Next, government acts on order people to have social distance or to isolate. Next, we are alert to do, and we don't trust people that might be exposed to COVID. Migration is, a, is seen as a menace. Next, so world need to start working on repair the damage of social cohesion done by COVID-19. The damage is not only economic, but it goes deep in society roots. A new diagnosis of social cohesion should be carried on after the pandemic. Next. The third challenge of the method is inclusion of the SDG figures. There is a world consensus on them, and I think it will be a great idea to include in social cohesion, measuring the SDG goals for um, development. Next. So a new method must include SDG goals, new technology, impact on COVID, and this will be do have to be run in new regional and global studies and diagnosis will be needed. Finally, the third statement on social cohesion is that social cohesion is a public policy ideology. Next, social cohesion is a society that tried to close the gap. Next, a society with social cohesion means equality and fairness. Next a society that is friendly with their population, but also with immigrants. Next, a society where equality is set up in housing, education. Next, healthcare, income, gender, and utility access. Social cohesion is a great concept to set goals to government, international organization, and multilateral financial institution. We have, we have seen that COVID-19 pandemic is a big crisis, but from crisis always come opportunities. We have an opportunity. Build society with social cohesion, society with better future for the upcoming generations with trust, with care, with solidarity. Thank you very much.
you so much, Pablo. Uh, and now uh, we're moving to the first panel discussion uh, and we'll be on looking beyond COVID-19 and moderated by uh, Dr. Suzanne al -Qurashi. Um Floor is yours, Dr. Suzanne. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, the COVID-19, oh, oh, sorry, F first I want to thank uh, uh, Pablo for an insight, insightful look uh, into the origins and aspects of social cohesion. Thank you. Um, we, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced the need to establish transparent methods of evaluating impacts of health crisis on nations across the globe. The disjointing efforts have created the need for establishing correlation on health and research efforts, not just to counter the spread of the disease, but also mitigate economic impact caused by it. Our first panelist is uh, Mark Lerbein, Task Force Co uh, for Co-Chair. He's a professor of economics in Princeton University and Paris School of Economics. Mark is the also the co-author of the policy brief assessing the well-being impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and three policy types, suppression, control, and uncontrolled spread. The floor is yours, Mark. Thank you, and let me start by thanking the organizers of T20 and especially our lead co-chair, uh, Suzanne al Kurashi, who has done a tremendous uh, job leading this whole group. Um, and um, uh, yes, I would like to address the difficult uh, situation for governments facing a crisis like COVID-19 and future pandemics are, are sure to come. So we need to develop better tools and especially tools to address the trade-off between saving lives and saving livelihoods, uh, the economy versus health. Um, and um, the main uh, focus of my uh, short uh, talk will be about the fact that we need to develop uh, tools to address the inequalities that are uh, salient in this kind of situation. And so we need to go beyond the basic cost-benefit analysis that only relies on global figures like the value of statistical lives and just multiplying this value by the number of lives saved. The situation is more complex. And we had an excellent uh, introduction to the question of social cohesion with a previous talk. And so I would like to highlight that in this uh, particular context of a pandemic, we have two dimensions of inequalities to uh, take into account. Uh, the first dimension is somehow the classical one, the social dimension of inequalities. And there we have uh, to take into account the fact that there are background inequalities between social groups. Uh, and these inequalities are not just in terms of income and wealth, they are also in terms of uh, life expectancy and health conditions. Um, and against these background conditions, these background inequalities, a crisis like a pandemic creates new inequalities and uh, very often reinforces these inequalities. And you have a distribution of health impacts across social groups and a distribution of economic impact across social groups. And in uh, what we have been observing, it sounds like uh, in most of the cases, the background inequalities are reinforced by both the sanitary, the health impact and the economic impacts. But this is one dimension of inequalities. The other dimension that is salient in certain pandemics and has been very salient in the COVID-19 situation is the inequality between cohorts, generations, age groups. Um, the, as you know, the health impact of the uh, pandemic has been mostly on the elderly people, whereas the economic impact of the restriction measures that have been taken to preserve lives have been mostly on working people, people of working age, and also on people of school age uh, due to the closure of schools. And so this is a dimension of inequality that is also important to take into account and um, for which the um, uh, situation is not just about the impact, but also about the background inequalities, which are actually complex because the uh, younger people 
they have advantages of uh, being born later than the elderly people who are more vulnerable to the pandemic. So they benefit from the growth that we have uh, uh, witnessed for the last decade. Um, and they also benefit from the better health uh, systems and the improvements we've made in life expectancy. So they, they start from a better background condition. Nevertheless, um, they also have some special difficulties and in many countries, the uh, early career stage is more difficult for the young generation than it was for their parents at the same age. So the, uh, these background inequalities are very complex. And so what, I'm, uh, what, what my co-authors and I have been trying to argue in our policy brief is that these various dimensions of inequalities should not be neglected and should be uh, carefully examined by, by governments. Let me uh, conclude this uh, brief talk by mentioning some, um, uh, some very uh, basic lessons that some uh, uh, summary modeling of the uh, crisis and policy response suggest about, especially about the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, when you, uh, and, and particularly I'd like to briefly mention that rigorous modeling is actually very helpful to understand the dynamic of the, of the problem and the possible outcomes of various policies. In particular, uh, suppression policies, so policies that are based on reducing uh, social contacts um, are, um, uh, can be defined along two dimensions. They can be more or less severe, so the percentage of reduction of, con of contact is one dimension, and they can last longer or less long. That's another dimension. So time and severity of the measure. And there is a trade-off uh, along these two dimensions. And, and um, the, the, it's, uh, it's not easy to address this trade-off. So um, there seems to be a preference for very tough measures that are shorter, that can be shorter because they are tougher. But this is, uh, this is, of course, there are limitations to how tough you can be in suppressing contact between people. So this is a very difficult situation. Another remark I'd like to make is that um, this is very difficult for societies and, and their uh, leaders, because when you start this uh, policy of reducing social contact, there is a cost that you feel immediately, which is the economic cost uh, and the difficulty of, uh, of preserving livelihoods. Uh, and the benefit is, is coming later uh, in the, the reduction of the spread of the virus. And so it's a pain that people have to endure. And so you need a, a very good governance, very clear, transparent governance, and a cooperative uh, spirit, a cooperative ethos in the population to, uh, to adhere, to, to follow the indications, the guidance, and, uh, and make the policy successful. Uh, of course, there are many other dimensions. I've been talking about suppression, but uh, testing is something that is very important to make these various policies uh, more efficient. The timing of when you start these policies is also another uh, complex thing. So in general, it looks when you look at the experience of various countries, the earlier you start the reaction of the country, the better. And that seems to be the presumption uh, for many uh, uh, in the public debates, including in the media. It's not always true, actually. In some cases, it might be uh, justified to start a little later. Um, and that is something that you realize when you do the, the modeling. Um, another complexity that uh, we have not addressed in our policy brief is the fact that the pattern of transmission of the disease depends very much on spatial. And we had a, a good presentation of network in the previous talk. Uh, the networks between people vary a lot across countries. And some countries have very dense population, densely populated areas and also sparsely populated areas. And so the transmission is very different in these various areas. And that makes the uh, the management of the crisis even more complex. I think I'm, I'm uh, done with my time and I would like to give the floor back to, um, uh, to Suzanne. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, we go next to, uh, we'll invite uh, Jorgen Bernstein from Harvard Kennedy School to present uh, the core recommendation of the policy a governing diagnostic government 19 and the G20. Uh, I think uh, is session is a session with uh, yes, and also his colleague session, uh, Sylvia Harvard School of Public Health. We start with you, uh, Jorgen. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> thank you, Susan and Mark, for your leadership on this very important topic. 
And I would like to start by highlighting some general observations and then I switch over to my colleague Sashin who will go into more the technical details of the report. So first of all, there's a tremendous need for global preparedness for future pandemics, uh, specifically through a joint effort between the G20 community and also beyond. And COVID-19 was a shock to the social system and to social cohesion at every level, either directly as a consequence of the disease or indirectly as a consequence of government actions and remedies to address this disease. Um, we believe that diagnostics play a key role or the central role in absorbing this shock and thereby contributing to the G20's effort towards social cohesion, towards the promotion of social cohesion among its members. And as Mark highlighted very nicely in his talk, that the key to this is the timing, but also the scaling. However, we have seen in the most recent or in the current pandemic that entrusting pandemic diagnostics solely to governments or solely to markets doesn't always work how we envision it. And based on these insights and based on these empirical insights, we have developed a proposal for a global pandemic diagnostic platform. And I would like to um, Give, give the floor now to Sashin, who will continue. Thank you. Thanks, Jürgen. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon from Saudi Arabia, I guess. Um, thanks, Mark and Suzanne. Um, as, as Jürgen mentioned, um, and, and as, as Mark laid the, the foundation um, for, for this discussion, um, the, the disparities and deficiencies in, in in global health have been brought to light by um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and there has been a long-standing, um, this has been a long-standing issue um, in specifically in settings where there's a high disease burden, but that lack the purchasing power um, to, to have the health products available. Uh, this, has also been, uh, this has often been called a market failure, though it is technically not so. Um, and it has all often been discussed from the perspective of vaccines. Um, from the perspective of diagnostics, the issue is much more severe and exaggerated um, because diagnostics are more specialized. They're much more specialized by specific um, disease areas and sub-diseases. Um, and COVID-19 has really brought to light this, this issue in global health, <clears throat> where due to the absence of, of purchasing power, products are not available. Um, primarily because um, the, closure, the closure of borders um, and then you know, the supply lines have been interrupted. So where there is no manufacturing capacity, um, there has been an absence of, there has been a difficulty getting diagnostics to those populations. Um, another issue has been the longstanding absence of a global coordinating mechanism um, to, to ensure, to synchronize um, and to enable uh, global markets. Um, and our, our brief uh, proposed such a mechanism. Um, and um, we also, we, because we felt that this was an area that the G20 could really get engaged in, especially now in light of uh, COVID-19. Um, the mechanism that we proposed is based on a mechanism that has been envisioned uh, for making vaccines available. Um, the Coalition for Epidemic uh, preparedness and innovation, CEPI, um, but uh, what we proposed goes beyond it. Uh, specifically, uh, we proposed four functions um, that this mechanism uh, would undertake um, or, or would enable. Um, uh, the first is raising capital. The second is pulling that capital and, and channeling that capital towards um, prioritized 
manufacturing and um, research and development and manufacturing. Uh, thirdly, enabling diagnostics markets. And fourthly, um, guaranteeing the security of those markets. There's two trends um, in, in global health that we think that such a mechanism can really tap into. Um, the first is um, this emergence and sort of this ebb and flow of traction with regard to innovative financing for global health. Um, so innovative financing goes beyond the traditional uh, mechanisms of financing um, and, and innovative financing mechanisms such as push and pull mechanisms have been used in the past to address you know, the, the, the deficiencies um, in, in products being available in specific markets. The second trend that is much more recent and has been gaining a lot of traction um, prior to the, the shock of COVID-19 has been responsive manufacturing in diagnostics. Um, so in light of the Envision capabilities, in light of the two trends that I mentioned, um, we, we proposed um, a high level architecture for this coordinating mechanism. And, and more importantly, um, we, we highlighted four, uh, sorry, three uh, themes where the G20 can really get engaged. Um, the first is through a declaration to enhance collaboration, um, not just making diagnostics available, but from the perspective of diagnostics availability for pandemic preparedness. Um, there is a declaration already, but it is for making diagnostics available, not from the perspective of pandemic preparedness. Um, secondly, um, such a declaration should acknowledge um, the need for aligning mandates of international organizations. I think this is a, this is a serious problem now. Um, I shouldn't say serious problem, but this is an issue um, because, because diagnostics has not traditionally fallen under um, the exclusive uh, purview of the WHO necessarily. Um, there are several international organizations that are working on sort of the same issue, but you know, not in a, a coordinated manner. Um, the third, um, which I believe is very important, is a stock taking of the global diagnostics uh, manufacturing landscape. Um, because to enable markets, the diagnostics manufacturing, the research and development and manufacturing capacity has to be understood. Um, this is not known. The Foundation for Innovative Diagnostics, um, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, FIND, based in Geneva, um, has, um, has been the leader uh, in ensuring um, you know, healthy markets for diagnostics and enabling them. Um, and, and since um, our, our brief was um, introduced um, and since our brief was, since we had envisioned this idea, uh, you may have heard of the, the access to COVID tools uh, diagnostics accelerator that the WHO um, has put out um, a, 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 a brief on and there's lots of discussions going on. So it is materializing. Um, which is good, which is great. Um, we proposed and, and the effort has, you know, sort of the, the initial building blocks have been, uh, have, have come together. Um, and now it is particularly timely for the G20 uh, to get involved, especially in light of the ACT, the Access to uh, COVID Tools Diagnostics Accelerator. Thank you very much. The floor is back to you, Suzanne. Okay, thank you, Sashang, well, and Robin, too. Well, I will uh, go back to uh, Mike. Uh, uh, well, um, just for G20 leaders, Mark, which policy recommendations, immediate impl Im implementation, could help reduce the economic impact of the pandemic? The immediate one, I mean. Oh, that's a tough question, Susan. Uh, I think that the immediate thing that should happen is uh, the integration of uh, social and public health policies. Um, so it's, uh, it's, as I mentioned uh, in my uh, talk, the focus should be on the inequalities that are reinforced by the crisis. And they can also be reinforced by the policies that are implemented. And so integrating this is, uh, is very important. Many governments have uh, tried to alleviate the consequences of the, of the crisis. But somehow uh, there is a feeling that in some countries, the, the focus is, is declining now and uh, people are eager to go back to the uh, startup thinking. So I think that the attention should remain 
uh, should remain alert on this issue. And the, especially uh, because the virus will stay with us until we have found good treatments or a good vaccine, um, we need to, to stay alert and stay alert to the inequality consequences. So it's not exactly a, a one measure, but it's this idea of integrating the social and the public health is, um, I think, is key. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, uh, uh, Krishna, we'll, I, I have one for you. Is how does investing in uh, a unified data platform affect social cohesion in your perspective and your research? Uh, I'm sorry, are you asking me? Yes, yes, it was, yes. Krishna, it was difficult to hear you. Yes. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? Sorry, it's, it's a little it's, bit difficult to hear you. How does investing in a unified data platform affect social cohesion from your perspective? Um, from the perspective of health yeah, products, from the health, uh, from the perspective of health products, uh, yes. which is sort of my area of specialization, vaccines and diagnostics, um, you, you know, as I mentioned, you know, understanding um, the diagnostic manufacturing capacity is critical. Um, it's not understood now, um, and there is no single. Um, there's no platform of any sort, you know, for vaccines there is, for, you know, burden of disease there is, um, it doesn't exist from the perspective of diagnostics. And that's, I think that's a good idea that you, that you mentioned. Um, yeah. um, yes, it's, it's yes. very much needed. Yes, yes, I think so. Uh, well, I can't and, see Jorgen, <clears throat> you want to add something, Jorgen? I, yes, sorry. I just wanted to, to uh, follow on on this in terms of how investing in, in, the, in this such a, so in such a platform affects uh, um, social cohesion and contributes to it. So if you, if you look at the different levels of social cohesion, which has been affected by COVID-19, starting from uh, very basic things such as social distancing and and if we look at the at the social infrastructure in general and at the, at the work environment um, it is uh, the first step to get the society together again to sort of shrink the social distancing through uh, an effective implementation of, of diagnostics. So this is a first step in this direction to getting back uh, to business in social and economic sense and thereby addressing social cohesions in a, in a sort of a comprehensive sense. So it affects every aspect of that. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Well, uh, in one or two, or two lines, how would you sum up the most important takeaway from your policy briefs for the leaders? I mean, for Mark and Jorgen, and I'm also uh, Sasha. We start with you, Mark, please. Uh, yes, I, I think I, I already uh, mentioned the main takeaway, which was this uh, social cohesion focus. But the, the other thing that I think is important is uh, the need for uh, close coordination. Um, this is not something we highlighted very much in our brief, but other briefs have, have said that. And this is indeed important because um, uh, what happens in one country can have strong impacts on what happens in other countries. And we are here in the context of the G20. So coordination is needed more than ever in this uh, kind of crisis. This is what I said in my, uh, my speech. Uh, so Jorgen, you want to, the same. Uh, I. I fully agree with, with Mark that actions of one country in diagnostic markets affecting or has direct effects on, on other countries because we're talking of a global market and it's transmitted. So collaboration is fundamentally important and the G20's role in this is super critical. Can I add something, Suzanne? Um, so the the access to COVID tools accelerator, um, which I mentioned, um, I'm, I have a first hand, first, uh, first hand glimpse into um, the initial work of, you know, coming together by the various entities um, in enabling this um, accelerator. And so um, COVID-19 has created this sense of urgency, right? And this sense of urgency sort of is sort of a pushback against a well thought out and coordinated effort in a sense, right? Because there's such an immediate need for certain tools. 
And there's also this very large influx of financing that's available. Um, so because of that, there's, there's a certain sense of chaos almost um, in coming together to enable um, a specific objective. Um, and when you're dealing with cross-border stakeholders, manufacturers in various countries, um, it, you know, it sort of becomes a little bit problematic because the nature of the pandemic is different in each country. Uh, the priorities and constraints are different. And therefore, you know, coordination is all the more important just given the context of what the pandemic has created in sense of from the perspective of the urgency and from the perspective of the resources that are available. Um, so it's, it has sort of heightened the need for coordination is what I'm trying to say. Uh, since we came uh, at, yeah, very close to end of uh, our panel, I would like to each of you, please, Mark and Georgin and Sasha, give a uh, uh, final important uh, wish you wish, uh, or, or, or I mean, uh, advice or, or request for G20 leaders. Um, yeah, Suzanne, in, in France, there has been a, a survey um, that has asked how people were living through this crisis, so ordinary people. And um, I had the occasion to suggest a question in this survey. And the question I suggested with a colleague from the University of Bordeaux was about whether people felt that this crisis was bringing them closer to the fundamentals of life and to their true values. And uh, a majority of respondents said that indeed this crisis was the occasion to come back to the true priorities. So I hope that the leaders of the world can have the same sort of experience and realize that there are things which are extremely important, more important than what they usually spend their time about when they, uh, they discuss around the table of the G20. There are very important life and death issues and this is the time to address them and perhaps come back to good ideas for a better world. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, uh, session of Jorgen? Uh, yeah, just a brief note uh, that <clears throat> the, the current situation has shown how fragile uh, social cohesion is and uh, we need to do our utmost to, to, to preserve this and there are many different actions we need to do and what we highlighted in our brief is focuses on diagnostics but there is many further steps to be taken and to prepare for future pandemics. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and from my perspective, um, as, as an economist, um, I think, and this is more aligned with what Mark was saying, um, but from an operational perspective, um, from an economist perspective, you know, how we value um, health has very fundamentally changed uh, in light of this. Um, you know, whether we look at you know, cost benefit, costs, costs effectiveness, or whether we look at full income and value of a statistical life, um, you know, you know, what's the willingness to pay now in light of a pandemic, you know, as compared to what it used to be? Uh, how do people, you know, value reductions in, you know, mortality risk now, you know, in the presence of a global pandemic? So those questions are really important. Um, and, and that's why I said, you know, this, the context is so complex um, and there's so many things to be addressed. Um, and I think for those of us who are working on these problems, um, you know, it's, it's certainly going to be an interesting path forward. Um, that's it, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the panelists, uh, uh, Mark Fulbray, uh, Fulbray, uh, Fulbray <laughs> and uh, uh, Jorgen Bernstein and Sashan uh, Sylvia. I do appreciate your comprehensive uh, panel uh, and you give in, 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 in huge information to everyone uh, about uh, the importance of uh, how we deal, how we, how we invest, how we uh, can measure the, all these uh, crises to uh, face uh, the nations. And thank you so much and uh, go back to panel. Thank you, Dr. Suzanne, and for, uh, thank you for, for you all uh, for our second panel discussion. Um, now we're going, uh, we're going to discuss power share 
not power crabs and it will be moderated by the I think the voice, by the way, is very low. So let us we need to adjust that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, um, I want to congratulate uh, Saudi Arabia on an excellent performance and excellent management of the T20 uh, uh, process. And, and I wish them all the best for the process to be completed. This whole thing happened during a difficult um, year. Uh, and I think Saudi Arabia did a very good uh, job. Um, uh, I'm very glad to have been chosen to be um, one of the co-chairs of um, uh, task force, uh, task force four uh, about social cohesion, um, uh, mainly um, because social cohesion is one of the extremely important um, topics. As, as Mr. Pablo was uh, saying at the beginning, it has all the right messages, all the good things that we want to see in a society the equality, the fairness, the goodness. We always talk about it. They're always there in big principles, but in reality, nothing is happening um, about them. Um, very little is happening about it. There is very little um, talk about their um, importance and how to achieve those targets. Uh, this is why I'm, I'm extremely happy to be part of, the, uh, of this particular task uh, 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 for. And I would like uh, to um, thank Dr. Suzanne for her excellent management of the process through the year. Uh, having said that, let me talk about this specific panel where there is one specific paper that we're talking about. And um, the, the, the panel discussion is about power share and not power grab. When you look at this statement, it's extremely strong. It's exactly what we all wish for. Power share is what we need. Power grab is what everybody is doing. And, and what happened uh, uh, in COVID-19, what happened through COVID-19 is actually uh, emphasize how important it is to share power and not grab power because the entire world got affected. So sharing power and collaborating is the key message of the whole exercise. The question is, it's very easy to say, let's share power and not grab it, but how do we go about it? How do we implement it? One of the nice things, about um, the two speakers that we have today who are responsible for one of the policy briefs is that they are talking actually about the means of doing it. How do we actually share power? Not talk about it as a target, but talk about how uh, uh, it can take place. Now, um, uh, having said that, uh, I would like to, to change things a little bit, get out of the box a little bit. I'm not going to ask you to uh, to brief us about what you wrote in your papers. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is ask, actually ask a few questions and, and from your answers, get everybody, get the audience actually engaged also with us into what you are talking about. Um, uh, the title of your policy brief is Smart Decentralization, Accountability and Community Development Through Urban Self-Governance. And my first question is why the interest in urban areas? Why? Typically, we talk more about the rural areas. This is where the poverty is. This is where the problems are. Why are we talking about urban areas? And I, I leave it you know, to you to divide the answers. OK, yeah. Well, I guess I'll start off on that. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's very well appreciated. Uh, going back to your question on why the interest in urban areas. So when myself and Charles approached this matter, we knew from our research that urban centers and cities around the world are facing big social and economic challenges in the upcoming years. Today, it's around 55% of the world population lives in cities, and this number is expected to jump uh, to 70% by 2050. Now, combining this information by, uh, with what we know that inequality is on the rise in both emerging and developed economies, made myself and Charles want to find an urban-based solution founded on decentralization policies. Hence us coming up with the policy brief. Okay, thank you. Uh, you. You mentioned that you are trying to achieve good governance and equality. This is the dream of every society. And your entry point is that the top-down approach has failed. The bottom-up approach has also failed to achieve this target. How so? 
Um, well, first, let me just thank you, uh, Abla, and uh, and also uh, Dr. Suzanne and, and the other co-chairs um, for um, your great leadership of this. And, uh, and just want to say also thank you to all the other um, uh, members of this task force. It's been a real pleasure getting to know them. Uh, and uh, a thanks to the attendees uh, here with us uh, listening to um, the you know summary of the work that we've been doing. So this is all you know really gratifying, and and we really appreciate it. Um, so uh, as 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 Ferris said, you know we're our focus here is primarily on urban areas, uh, but we're hoping that um, some of the lessons um, uh, can be taken from urban to also rural localities eventually. But we think that urban areas. Are as as you know as Ferris said, 70% of people will be living in them by 2050. So um, we need to start there and kind of test drive some of these solutions. So to your question, um, uh, you know, there's there's a long literature on what um, local versus uh, national governments ought to do. Uh, the problem with national authority um, and relying entirely on national authority is first the problem of spillover effects that certain policies have interjurisdictional spillovers, and so they might be underprovided uh, by local governments. Uh, and it's secondly one of information uh, that local governments might, uh, sorry, that national governments might not have um, adequate information about local conditions and uh, might not be in a position to know what locales need. Um, on the uh, local government front, um, uh, local governments tend to be more directly accountable um, and they tend to have more information about what uh, people want. Um, but again, the problem is uh, spillover effects. Um, they might underprovide them. Um, the problem is also um, that uh, they may not have the fiscal or administrative resources to provide certain public goods. Uh, in many countries, um, perhaps most countries, uh, the national administration um, is uh, in a much better position to um, undertake complex provision of public goods and local administrations not in a position to do that. So, and the fiscal resources of the locales might not be fully developed. So our idea with smart decentralization, as we call it, is that we wanna draw on the relative strengths of both the national government in terms of its resources um, and its concern about spillovers in the local government in terms of its accountability and its information. And also as Ferris emphasizes uh, in his work, uh, community groups. So yeah, okay. adding to that actually, you know, the idea is creating policy cohesion between the two and combining, combining that approach to top down and bottom up uh, to strengthen, uh, strengthen the state institutions. That's the main uh, gist of it. Okay. Uh, so you're taking the good of the two methods and combining it together in what you call smart decentralization. Now, smart decentralization is a very interesting concept. I want you to describe uh, to the audience what you mean exactly by smart decentralization and how do you go about implementing it. First, do you want to start off here? Yeah. yeah, a simple way of looking at it, you know, from from our perspective, is that. You know, all citizens uh, are to feel represented by their governments. Governments must be brought closer to them, uh, must be brought closer to them in a way for them to participate. Uh, so in many cases that we've looked at, this ideology has promoted social civility, uh, reduced cor uh, corruption, and stimulate economic growth. Now, a close and good example of this would be the city of Lisbon, where they've achieved a participative model for working in the private neighborhoods using an instrument that we also talk about in one of our principles, which uh, in our, one of our principles, which is community-led local development. And they use it in a way to push tailor-made local initiatives forward in order to achieve uh, what the needs and desires of communities are. Okay. And uh, would you like to add? Sure, um, I, I would second everything that Ferris said and, and just note um, smart decentralization is a term that we use to essentially note that decentralization is critical, but um, we also, that decentralization needs to um, also be done in such a way that it, that it makes full use of, of the strengths of higher tiers of government and of community groups, not just putting the burden entirely on local governments. It's critical, of course, to have strength in local governments, but these local governments can't do it alone. 
uh, and they need to have a uh, cooperative relationship uh, with community groups and with higher tiers. And, and for us, smart decentralization, we, we develop in the policy brief um, five uh, basic principles that we think underlie smart decentralization. And, and very briefly, that's jumpstarting community development, as Ferris said, um, delegating key powers to local governments, um, encouraging the development of community organizations, um, developing institutions of downward accountability for local uh, political leaders, and promoting polycentric uh, cooperation among relevant government and non-governmental actors. So those are kind of the five core tiers of what we call, or five core principles of what we call um, smart decentralization. So, so smart really means intelligent decentralization. It's not necessarily related to digitization, or probably it would be actually in relation to information and making information available. Uh, um, okay, uh, Ferris, would you would you um, elaborate on uh, a couple of the principles that were mentioned by Charles as being the steps for implementing um, smart decentralization as suggested in your policy brief? Yeah, so I'll talk, uh, excuse me? Choose two of the principles that you have to elaborate a little bit on each one of them. Okay, so starting off actually by the first principle, which is that central and state governments should jumpstart community development in cities. The way we see this is that it starts off with investigating local needs, first of all, looking at what the community needs and what, uh, what, uh, what important factors are, uh, are a matter of importance for them. Then it's committing the resources for key projects to create public interest and promote equality. Uh, from there, we push on to investigating local government's capacity and potential, potential partnerships. So basically, all in all, give, bring, bring the trust back, uh, back into the central governments and have communities want to engage to start off, uh, to start off this factor. So starting from the, top, uh, from the top down, but getting the participation uh, from, uh, of the local, authority, uh, local authorities and, uh, uh, and communities to be part of this. So this would, this would start off as the beginning. The beginning. Uh, from there also, we looked at central and governments having to delegate uh, uh, delegate powers to local po uh, political leaders and responsibility and capacity to provide urban public goods. What we mean here is that they should include at a minimum expenditure powers, just like uh, Charles was saying, uh, over, over such policies such as roads, water, waste, and perhaps uh, primary education and health. Uh, this, uh, this, this goes into to the second, uh, second part, of the smart decentralization uh, perspectives that we're looking into. Okay. Uh, what do you mean by polycentric cooperation? Um, so by polycentric cooperation, we're, we're um, we're drawing on um, kind of an expansive literature that um, challenges, um, Eleanor Ostrom in particular is associated with this, that, that challenges the, um, the general idea that, that, each, um, that each policy area should be allocated clearly to a particular tier. You know, that's the traditional argument in political economy as, as, as you all probably know, um, that clarity of responsibility um, is absolutely central. And so it's important to identify which particular tier should undertake uh, which particular policy. Um, Ostrom and others have challenged this idea with polycentric uh, governance um, and have emphasized the need for um, cooperation across tiers, even within the same policy area. Um, recognizing that something, for example, like providing education um, is a complex uh, public good. And so it can be useful to draw on the expertise of different tiers. Perhaps one tier, you know, is better able to uh, manage the building and the property. Another one um, managing the curriculum. Um, another one doing the hiring and firing of teachers and so on and so forth. So polycentric governance makes use of a um, multitude of tiers of government and also encourages the cooperation and participation of community actors to provide um, the best governance possible. And that's something that we emphasize, um, emphasize here. Very interesting. Now, now let's move to the actual action. How can G20 push for this? 
for this happening in countries? How can G20, what are the tools that you suggest G20 can use? Uh, because this is the whole, the whole concept of the key objective of the whole exercise is to put this on the agenda of the G20 to talk about in their meetings, okay? What will they talk about? How to implement this? I want, I need to hear both of you. So I guess Paris can start and then Charles. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start off with that. Well, we know that uh, the G20 policy goals include improving, uh, improving governments, legit, uh, legitimacy, accountability, and trust in state institutions. Uh, in addition to that, the Saudi presidency emphasizes on the empowerment of citizens uh, and makes it especially appropriate for, for the G20 to address, uh, address the issue of local governance today. Now, our policy brief recommendation looks to the inception of, uh, to the inception of an intergovernmental panel of scholars, practitioners, in order to develop this, these series of uh, best practices using the decentralization as, uh, as a base, mainly to encourage good, uh, good government, improved and strengthened participation uh, and accountability while fostering community development. So uh, in, the, uh, in the world developing, uh, uh, community development in the world's developing cities. Now, keeping in mind that the G20 accounts for 64% of the world population uh, currently living there, it's a big, uh, a big push and encouragement for them to, uh, to put on their agenda. Charles? Yeah, and, and if I may, Abla, just to, to hit on, before I, I address that, just to hit on uh, a couple of, of additional uh, principles that we didn't, didn't talk about as much. I just wanted to mention um, the importance of community mobilization um, in the policy brief. Um, you know, we emphasize, and this, a lot of this is Ferris's work, you know, we emphasize the importance of community organizing and especially community-led local development and the importance of encouraging non-governmental community groups um, that can do things like participate in participatory budgeting and do other things there. Um, and we, we also emphasize the critical importance of local accountability of the local government. Um, this is most frequently done through elections and there's a large literature on um, elections and the importance of those and in and, 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 uh, local accountability, but there are also other forms of local accountability that can be important. Um, such as having, you know, informal advisory panels, benchmarking, you know, that higher tiers of government will hold local government accountable for, um, you know, particular benchmarks, quantitative benchmarks often, um, or competition among local governments uh, so that they, you know, essentially, you know, push each other forward by competing for citizens funding and so forth. Uh, and so uh, accountability is absolutely critical here. It's, it's kind of at the core of good governance, as we all know. Um, as far as implementation, um, you know, F Ferris uh, said it well, you know, we, we, want, we, we realize that these five principles are not specific enough. Um, and we also realize the importance of buy-in. And so what we'd like to do is, is what we'd like to see is a intergovernmental panel of experts and policymakers kind of um, digging down into this using the five principles, perhaps, but um, but moving a little bit deeper in terms of what their recommendations are for local government, um, and we we'd like to see, if possible, um, you know, once these things are developed, uh, both the moral leadership of the G20. Obviously, you know, this includes, as Ferris said, most of the world's population critical states and so forth. And also perhaps some of this incorporated into uh, foreign aid packages because most of the world's donors are in the G20 as well. And foreign aid um, can be used to, for example, fund and create, help to create community organizations, fund the strengthening of local governments, um, you know, better uh, civil administration, um, you know, fund training for local, um, assemblies and, and all of these things. So we think there are a variety of ways and mechanisms that the G20 can encourage smart decentralization. Very good. Uh, now let's move on to the last question and actually the most challenging one. Why would I as a government accept this and go for it? G20 is gonna push for it, but I will not go for it. There is a precondition for any of this to work is to have decentralization 
and for governments to want decentralization, decentralization cuts the power at the national level. It gives it to the communities. It gives them the authority to have budgets of their own and so on. Why would I go for this? How can you push me to go for this? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh... Well, this is why I'm leaving it to the end, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can look at it this way, you know, furthering the decentralization strategies is, it's a good opportunity to, to make cities more dynamic. Uh, and making cities more dynamic from, uh, from our perspective is directly correlated to the United Nations SDGs. Just to think off the top of my head, reducing poverty, general equality, sustainable cities, Partnerships, etc. You know, just just to name a few. So that that could be that could be one uh, one incentive. Now, promoting decentralization would also encourage development uh, of insights into the needs of people living in urban areas, and that's how we're talking about. That's the beginning of the policies. Now, that in general, it means one thing: it gen generating data, and data today is probably one of the most valuable commodities of our age. Uh, so gathering data on, on local preferences can assist central governments to create effective local government mechanisms in their effort to tackle future challenges. And it's, it's just a, exactly what Charles was saying prior. Uh, it's to make cities compete with each other for citizens, for resources, for, uh, for funding. And, you know, in my perspective, it can also further uh, social stability in countries by giving the communities their needs rather than an overall solution. Charles? Yeah, Abla, you always ask the, the hard questions <laughs> and we've, we've relied on that throughout this process. Um, you know, the feedback that you've given us and we really appreciate the hard questions because it makes us think, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's in um, the interests of governments um, to implement this. Um, in part because it will benefit their citizens, it will promote the SDGs, as Farah said. And I think from a more um, selfish perspective, I suppose, um, governments are more likely to be reelected, to be stable um, when their citizens are happy. Uh, and their citizens are going to be more happy when uh, urban areas are better run, um, when they have more voice in urban um, issues. Uh, when local governments are more empowered, you know, decentralizing that, as, as you know, there's a big literature on why governments, exactly the question you ask, why governments would consider, you know, decentralizing and giving away power, because many of them have done it. And, you know, part of it is, is uh, you know, you can, you spread around the responsibility so that governance is better. And part of it is you spread around the responsibility so that, um, you know, blame is dispersed if things don't go well. And part of it is if, if you lose office, um, you know, at the center, um, you still have the opportunity to gain office, you know, in regional and local governments. Um, so it, it kind of also depressurizes the political system by making it not be a winner take all sort of situation where you either govern at the center or you don't govern at all. Um, so I, I think it's in the interests of states, but, it, but I think also foreign aid can be a way um, to encourage um, this, uh, these sorts of uh, uh, decentralization programs um, by basically, you know, the international community's willingness to fund local governments, the international community saying, you know, we, um, we care about good governance, but we don't want to channel all of our funding through the central government. We want to channel our funding through uh, regional and local governments as well. We want to build up their capacity. Uh, and uh, so that that mechanism can be also a way of encouraging countries to, to implement um, these sorts of ideas. I, I, I agree completely. It is good for the citizens, that's for sure. And this is really the aim behind social cohesion. Governments will be convinced that if people are happy, then their chances to remain in office are higher. But definitely the foreign aid and the, don the international community can put conditions to make sure that the community level is addressed in the smart decentralization way that you're suggesting. Thank you very much, uh, Ferris Abouzid from Malo Collective and Charles Hankla, uh, the associate professor in Georgia State University.
Um, um, I'm, I'm very glad to be moderating this session. Uh, I have to say at the end that this particular policy brief was originally presented as two different policy briefs, and then they joined hands from two com different parts of the world, and the outcome actually turned out uh, uh, superior. Uh, so thank you very much, and I thank the um, audience who are with us, and I thank Dr. Uh, Suzanne again for her leadership of this work, and Dr. Fahd for his uh, uh, leadership of the entire T20 group, and thank you very much. Back to you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Harris, for this great uh, discussion. Now uh, we're moving to the task force uh, art presentation. Uh, as you may know, art is a universal language, transcending uh, barriers of language and time. And uh, the T20 uses art to communicate its themes, priorities, and policy recommendation to all. Uh, please allow me to introduce Mesa Shazan. Mesa uh, was born in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, she is uh, a psychologist by training, who considers uh, her art to be a form of visual expression uh, that uh, speak to, to the conscious mind. Uh, Mesa will be presenting her art work today that is called uh, Symbol yet complex. Uh, just before that, uh, please allow me uh, to inform you that uh, there will be uh, an interpretation during the, the webinar. You can choose the preferred language uh, from the right hand side of the bottom bar. Um, the language will be uh, English and Arabic. Um, so now we're gonna uh, move it to Mesa. Uh, floor is yours. <laughs> طلع معايا وبنى نفسه بنفسه وتصاعد معايا بهذا الطريقة كون حلقة كون كون زوايا كون شكل كون محور متكامل أشوفه في الشخص أشوفه في أسرة أشوفه في قبيلة أشوفه في مجتمع متكامل أشوفه في العالم كله هو ده التكوين شيء مني شيء منك شيء مع الزمن شيء مع البيئة إحنا ممكن نتواصل مع بعض الارتفاع في العمل هي نتيجة محصلة لل... لوضع الاستناد للتآزر اللي موجود في ال... بين الهياكل قصة مؤازرة قصة مساندة قصة ثقة قصة تمحور كل مثلث هو البطل بدوره لكن بنفس الوقت هو مستند على على غيره كنا نستند على حضاراتنا على ماضينا ما حنقدر ننشأ الآن من من لا شيء ضروري ضروري إنه نشعر بإنه إحنا مستندين على بعض وإحنا بنكمل في الارتفاع وبنحاول الأجيال القادمة بنحاولها هذا العمل على بساطته لما يتراكب على بعض بدون أي لحام هنا هنا أتحدث عن الثقة اللي نحتاجها إنه نتماسك فيها مع بعض بسيط ولكنه معقد بيحمل كل المفاهيم وأتخلى عن كل المفاهيم في هذا العمل Maisha, the, the, the floor is yours. Tfadali, 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 Maisha. Is it muted? We, uh, we can't hear you, Maisha. Uh, still, we can't, we can't hear you. Uh, 
Um, is it muted or? No, nice, nice, nice. Sort and Montaz, Monkin, come. Okay, you can speak now. نسمعك نسمعك تفضلي نسمعك تفضلي يا ميسا ميسا تفضلي Is there anything wrong with the system? What's happening? We can't hear you, Susan. Oh, okay. Well, I now we can. Okay, I will tell the technician. Uh, excuse me, uh, Tim. Did, did you hear I the think artist? we have an issue with the with the interpreter, so we oh. apologize for this te technical issue. تفضل كمل يا ميسا وممكن خلاص على النهاية. صنعت بتراكمها الثقافي والمعرفي والاجتماعي والسياسي. With this political.
ايوه ناو اي كان هير ميس ميسا اوكي اوكي ثانك يو يا اهلا فصناعه كان تقريبا هذا العمل كان هذا العمل خلاصه ابحاث اربع سنوات اربع سنوات واكثر في في التراث وفي الاثار التي خلفوها التي تركوها لنا جدودنا ما كان رمزا بسيط كان رمز يحمل الكثير من المعادلات والمعاني والقيم كان يحمل قيمة الحماية والكرم قيمة الخوف والأمان كان يتحدث عن الكثير هذا الشكل الهندسي تراكب معايا بطريقة كأنه الهمم تراكبت فوق بعضها البعض لتصنع من تراكمها المعرفي والثقافي والاجتماعي عمق المعنى وعمق الحضارة لما جيت أختار الخامة اللي أبغى أنفذ فيها هذا العمل حبيت أختار خامة تشبهنا إحنا كالإنسان قوي وصل ذو بأس شديد لا يتحمل يتحمل الكثير مما لا يحتمله الآخرون لكن في نفس الوقت طباعنا الإنسانية تخلينا شديدين التأثر بالمحيطين فينا وشديدين التأثر بما يحدث لنا فكان الحديد هو أقرب خامة وجدتها أنا برأيي تشابهنا كلما مر عليه الزمان كلما تآكل وأصبح أكثر أكثر عرضة للتجارب وأكثر تحدثا عن تجاربه كل إنسان كلما بغى من الزمان وكلما وكلما مرت به التجارب أصبح أكثر حكمة وخبرة فعلشان كده هو تقريبا العمل كان من الحديد كانت المثلثات بزاوية ستين درجة وهي عند الأسبقين ومن سبقونا وعلماء الرياضيات وعلماء وعلماء الفيزياء وعلماء التصميم والعمارة زاوية ستين درجة هي حالة خاصة إذ هي الزاوية الوحيدة التي إذا تراكمت على بعض وتراكمت في بعضها البعض صنعت الدعم وصنعت المساندة وصنعت المؤازرة لما لما يريده هذا البناء حتى يقوم ويرتفع وأشكركم Thank you so much, Mesa, for this great uh, presentation. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, thank you. You can mute. Uh, your speaker. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we're moving to uh, the third panel discussion. Uh, will be on tackling the raising wealth gap, and uh, will be moderated by uh, Task Force Four uh, co-chair uh, Gianluca uh, Grambolda. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I have the pleasure to be here with uh, Katarina Lima Miranda, a researcher at the Kiel Institute for the World Economy, and uh, Agustin Redonda, who is a senior fellow at the Council on Economic Policies. And uh, um, for, before starting, let me thank um, again uh, Susan. Uh, Hannah in al Sudais uh, and all the people who worked uh, in this uh, task force and more generally uh, for uh, the T20. Um, so I am here in the rather uncomfortable position of being at the same time a moderator and a speaker. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, uh, my own policy brief, but I will limit that to the first four or five minutes and then I'll leave the floor uh, to my honorable colleagues. And uh, so what we um, try to do, so we had before a brilliant uh, introduction, a brilliant keynote by Pablo Ava on uh, the foundations of social cohesion in a historical perspective. And typically social cohesion uh, by definition applies to a group and uh, typically the group that has been considered the, the target uh, in order to think of social cohesion has been uh, the country. 
but uh, um, me with um, uh, my co-authors, uh, Mark Flerbe, uh, Fernando Filiera, and Ruben Lowallo, thought that uh, it would be important uh, to um, think through the foundations of uh, uh, global social cohesion. And of course, at the time of a retrenchment of multilateralism, this is uh, uh, particularly challenging, but it's probably precisely at this time that uh, this is uh, even more uh, needed. And uh, so we thought uh, we advocate uh, in our uh, policy brief a, um, a proposal that uh, is uh, admittedly not one for the short run, uh, but uh, the, the, the core idea is uh, to uh, use uh, the institution of a global uh, universal basic income as um, a tool to build a notion of uh, global uh, citizenship. So a global universal basic income uh, is uh, a universal basic income. So that is a proposal that uh, is now being discussed uh, in many countries, but uh, this will be applied to uh, the global level. So it is a, a periodic payment uh, unconditionally delivered to all people worldwide without a means testing or work requirement, paid in cash or uh, other appropriate form. So there are uh, many different ways to uh, defend uh, the, the, the universal basic income. Um, and in the policy brief, we uh, examine the philosophical, social, political, and the economic reasons uh, for that. Um, but uh, at the time of COVID, it's probably even uh, clearer than normal uh, what are the benefits of uh, a, a universal basic income. So COVID has been a, a sudden shock. Uh, it wasn't uh, unpredictable, many people predicted it, but uh, it has clearly caught most countries and maybe all countries uh, by surprise. And therefore the payment of uh, unconditional cash transfers uh, would be basically an automatic safety net. Um, so in particular, it is uh, the, the property of being unconditional that uh, would make uh, um, this uh, proposal so uh, valuable um, in, uh, in our view. So according to uh, the World Bank, uh, poverty uh, is going to increase by 140 million people because of COVID. Of course, it's uh, very difficult to make estimations, and this is the worst case scenario, but uh, uh, if you look at the graphs produced by the World Bank, poverty was going down and was going to uh, be in the region of uh, around 580 million people at the end of uh, um, 2021. And now because of COVID, uh, the World Bank estimates poverty to go up to uh, 720 million people. So the costs are immense for the countries that uh, lack the fiscal capacity in order to uh, weather the storm, so to speak. And so the institution of uh, this instrument would really uh, solve uh, many problems. And this is not the last crisis that we are going to face. So th th there will be other epidemics, uh, there will be climate change, the other uh, big um, uh, crisis that for sure, by if we follow the current path, uh, is going to affect all countries globally and therefore the institution of this instrument is all, all the more needed. So in the policy brief, we discuss the costs. So we estimate, just to give you some numbers, that paying a daily payment of 1.95 US dollars, so the level that is conventionally taken for to identify the poverty threshold, uh, would cost uh, about uh, um, 3% of a world GDP um, if uh, we apply purchasing power parity. So it's, um, it's clearly, it would be a big investment, uh, a big uh, cost, but uh, we, I think we should see this as really as an investment and not just uh, as, a, as an assistential policy. So there would be uh, feedback, a positive uh, feedback that uh, could be uh, gathered for sure. And I don't have the time to uh, go in detail into that. As for the funding, we also define, we also give some ideas and we try to quantify how much uh, international tax taxation could uh, yield to uh, fund the um, global universal basic income. And uh, we refer to a global carbon tax, 
to a global Tobin tax and uh, to also to um, uh, digital uh, taxation and also uh, uh, to a wealth tax. So all this uh, seems uh, very utopian, but there have been recently, I've heard uh, uh, more proposals in particular by the uh, Can Canadian government uh, jointly with the uh, UN uh, Secretariat General about the need to think of uh, unconditional cash transfers. So I think uh, we will uh, see more of uh, these in the future. So uh, this is all for uh, my own uh, policy brief. And now I would like to turn to uh, Katharina and um, um, Augustine. And so the first uh, uh, question to you is uh, yeah, very simple to talk us about the core objective of uh, your policy brief and uh, the expected role for the G20. Thank you. I would suggest Katharina to go first. I should go first. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you, Gianluca, um, for the introduction, and thank you for to the T20 uh, organizers. Um, it's been a great pleasure being part of this year's um, T20 process. So um, I want to briefly present some key points from our policy brief: recoupling economic and social prosperity that Dennis Noah and I have written for this task force. And in this policy brief, we present two new indexes of well-being, solidarity and agency to be considered alongside the standard indexes of material gain, GDP, for example. Um, and uh, well, why, why are we talking about recoupling? Well, we believe that a fundamental challenge of our age lies in the fact that the global economy is largely integrated, but global um, societies and polities remain fragmented. So in the last four decades, globalization and technological advances have generated significant growth of GDP, but this growth has been accompanied by rising inequality that we've just heard about uh, are likely to increase due to COVID-19. We see climate change um, or a rising sense of individual disempowerment just to name a few of the symptoms of decoupling. And uh, causes for this decoupling are seen in government policies that are focused excessively on economic prosperity. We see international spillover effects from globalization and automation. And we also see misguided individual decisions due to hurt behavior habits or status, for example. So in many countries around the world, economic prosperity, environmental performance, and social prosperity are uh, no longer aligned, they are decoupled. And tackling these challenges will involve confronting the paradox of growing economic activity in an integrated global economy, accompanied by ongoing tensions arising from fragmented societies and polities. Now, decoupling cannot be measured in terms of economic variables alone, since economic prosperity is not a reliable indicator of social prosperity. This is because human well-being depends on both economic and social prosperity since people have economic and social goals. So social prosperity, we believe, must be measured in terms of social variables, which are distinct from goods and services. And the underlying insight is that humans have several fundamental needs and purposes, each of which must be satisfied in order to generate human well-being. Now, our recoupling dashboard aims to capture this multiplicity of goals. And we propose it as a new theoretical and empirical basis for assessing well being beyond GDP. The recoupling dashboard consists of four indexes. Um, solidarity, S, covers the needs of humans as social creatures living in societies that generate a sense of social belonging. Agency A involves empowerment and covers people's need to influence their faith through their own efforts. Material gain G may be represented by GDP per capita, though the inadequacies of this index are well known. And environmental sustainability E may be measured by the environmental performance index, for example. And these are meant to embody a SAGE, S A G E, approach to assessing human well being aiming to note a wide range in sagacy in the pursuit and 
satisfaction of fundamental human needs and purposes. And one important uh, uh, factor is that these four goals, SAGE, are not consistently substitutable for one another. So um, our um, indexes must be understood as a dashboard. We've gathered data for um, uh, the last decades from G20 countries and beyond, and our analysis shows that the development of GDP per capita differs substantially from solidarity and agency over time. So in the country level, for example, it becomes clear that countries with a high GDP are not necessarily the ones that show high solidarity or agency. And in fact, in many countries and in high income countries um, like the US, uh, we see a substantial decrease in solidarity in the solidarity index over time. Um, so the way in which the four dimensions develop differently over time instead of moving together is an indication of the decoupling of economic and um, social prosperity. So our analysis indicates that globalization may be expected to become more clearly welfare improving only if it's accompanied by policy measures to strengthen social communities, counteracting the decline in solidarity and agency as experienced in many G20 countries. Furthermore, economic policies at the supranational level must not be implemented independently of those at the micro level because there's a crucial meso level of social groups at which important human needs and purposes are satisfied. Now the G20 as a multinational forum has unique capabilities to set global agendas and influence global norms and is therefore a very good forum to develop a framework for multi-level governance to encourage the recoupling of economic, political and social domains around the world. And what we recommend is that the G20 should encourage the recoupling of economic and social prosperity by putting fundamental human needs at the heart of G20 policies, by endorsing a more holistic picture of human well-being, in particular by including agency and solidarity into the regular reporting of national statistics, and by taking these as a basis for policy making. Furthermore, it will be important to harness the contributions of the private sector by enabling responsible actors through several channels. These may include stakeholder inclusive governance or reporting of private sector impacts on social development and externalities. And we believe that the recoupling dashboard is a first step towards reshaping governance systems in both government and business with the aim of recoupling economic and um, social prosperity. I'll stop here and I think we'll have some time in the discussion to follow up. Thank you. So let me now turn to Agustina. You have talked about the tax receipts and the tackling economic inequality in your policy brief. So please uh, tell us uh, the core ideas. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Gianluca. And thank you, Suzanne and the rest of the co-chairs for having led this great process. So yeah, this is a policy brief um, on tackling inequality through tax expenditure reform um, that I worked with uh, together with Professor Rita de la Feria. Um, let me directly jump into our main ideas here. So we know that the G20 has committed to, to the implementation of the 2030 agenda and the achievement of the SDGs, or the Sustainability Development Goals. And uh, reducing inequality, tackling inequality, is one of these SDGs, SDGs number 10. So uh, clearly, um, this is a commitment that G20 has done and where the efforts should increase. So fiscal and tax policy are among the main instruments to tackle inequality. The progressivity of the fiscal tax system uh, is often um, seen as one of the most powerful tools to, to uh, go in this direction. Yet what we observe is that the role of tax expenditures is somehow overlooked. So tax expenditures are all type of tax benefits, preferential tax um, treatment, tax deductions, tax credits um, that benefit a particular group of taxpayers or sectors um, seeking different policy goals. So there are many tax expenditures that are explicitly implemented to uh, mitigate inequality. That's what we call in the brief the direct effect. 
Uh, and there are other provisions that are implemented to reach different policy goals or policy objectives, such as attracting investment, creating employment, boosting pension savings, but uh, do have an undesired effect on the distribution of income, uh, income and, and wealth, or a negative externality uh, in, in, in the, by exacerbating inequality. This is what we call the indirect effect. So let me give you a quick example to make things clearer. When it comes to the direct effect and those provisions that actually um, aim or seek at reducing inequality, uh, it's very often the case in many countries that governments implement VAT related expenditure, so reduced rates or exempted goods or services in the context of VAT and other consumption taxes, where the, explicitly, the explicit goal of these provisions is exactly that one, to protect low income households and trigger a distributional um, effect. Um, but yet, uh, there are several factors that hinder the effectiveness of these provisions. Poor targeting, mm, sometimes the goods or services that are, are exempted from the tax base are clearly not goods that are relevant for the basket, consumption basket of poor individuals. In Colombia, for instance, uh, we have exemptions or reduced rates for electric cars, uh, electric vehicles, um, hotels or tourism in Switzerland is also um, benefiting from a reduced rate. But also, um, even when poor individuals consume those uh, affected goods or services, rich households often capture most of the benefits because in absolute terms, these individuals just spend more uh, in terms of, of, of the, the goods and services that they consume. The other big issue is tax incidence. Often it's assumed that the full, there's a full pass through of, uh, of, um, of the um, um, reduced rate into consumer prices, into lower consumer prices, but the evidence shows that this is not often the case. Um, when it comes to the indirect effect, so other provisions that have another policy goal, but still trigger uh, a concentration of inequality or exacerbation, uh, exacerbation of inequality, a, a clear example is the mortgage interest deduction in the United States. So this is a tax benefit, tax benefit for um, to deduct the interest of mortgages, and is one of the most expensive uh, provisions in the, in the United States, by the way. Uh, but there's evidence that it's very regressive. Why? Well, again, poor targeting is is an issue. Uh, those that can think about uh, um, asking for a mortgage to uh, buy real estate are clearly uh, the better off. Uh, so this is way uh, too far from from poor individuals that struggle to get a job or even to you know uh, get some food for their families. Um, but also these are these benefits are granted as deductions, and deductions have a me mechanical impact uh, on on inequality because the benefits increase with marginal tax rates. The more you earn, the larger is the benefit that we, you will receive. So because all this, uh, we propose a three-stage process to drive tax penetration reform. Very concretely, what we call or urge is that governments should estimate and report on tax expenditures. So this is crucial. Without data, we cannot move forward. As a second stage, governments should assess the distributive impact of tax expenditures they should start with those that are likely to have the largest impact of, on inequality, but uh, ideally pretty much all uh, provisions should be assessed or evaluated. And ultimately, what we are looking for is that uh, governments will reform their tax expenditure systems based on previous evaluations. So rationalizing the use of tax expenditures uh, can, be, can trigger at least two benefits. First, align the tax systems towards sustainability, towards more fair, um, more fair economy, but also would ease budget constraints, uh, would increase revenue collection, which is crucial always, but even more today uh, while facing the COVID-19 and the reduced fiscal space that is observed worldwide. So I will stop here, Gianluca. Thank you, thank you, Agustin. So, uh, yeah, as a part of this um, um, uh, session, we should also look at the broader impact of our proposals for development of the society. So, uh, let me ask uh, Katerina, especially in this uh, uh, 
situation, in this current situation with, in which we are still with the COVID, but of course we would also like to think of a post-COVID uh, world. I mean, what is uh, uh, the role for uh, the dashboards that uh, you propose and that do you expect uh, more or less uh, solidarity in this uh, period? Mm, that's a really tough question. Um, let me start with the current situation and um, why I believe that the, the recoupling dashboard can be useful uh, during the pandemic. I think uh, the pandemic has brought to light how strongly agency and solidarity affect well-being. And uh, this we've seen because of the implementation of policy measures um, as a response to the pandemic have severely affected both agency by restricting to move freely and solidarity, which became more difficult due to social distancing measures. So um, I think it made clear that uh, these, these two goals are um, inherent in human well-being and need, need, need to be assessed when we think about welfare of societies. Um, and one important aspect of evaluating the effectiveness of governments in coping with the pandemic is to look at how a society perceives the implemented containment measures, because this will impact on people's well-being and their coping with the crisis, as well as their willingness to comply with the implemented measures and therefore their success. Um, and um, We've done some analysis and, uh, for example, we show that in Germany, satisfaction with the risk management at the federal state level is positively correlated with solidarity, indicating that the higher solidarity was, the higher the satisfaction with the measures taken by the government. Now, this in turn might have an influence on how willing the population is to comply with these uh, containment measures, which are crucial for uh, these measures to be efficient. Um, um, so one conjecture is that compliance will be higher and relatively easier to implement if governments make sure that fundamental human needs are satisfied, in particular if solidarity within and between groups is high and individuals are given agency by being able to help themselves and their social groups. And one example where uh, this seems to have worked is a participatory slum upgrading project program in Buenos Aires, uh, the Villa 20, that has resulted in more social cohesion and fewer cases of COVID-19. So here we see how maybe we can increase solidarity at the very um, local level. And uh, on a more global scale, we also see that one of the very few significant social and political correlates of COVID-19 deaths in cross-national studies is social trust and trust in government. So in countries where trust is higher, um, we see lower um, death rates of COVID-19. So here, I think uh, COVID-19 is, is uh, a good example um, for governments to see that solidarity and agency is important. I'm, uh, I'm very doubtful what the impact will actually be on solidarity and agency, because on the one hand side, we are seeing stories of solidarity among neighborhoods and we see um, that people help each other. On the other hand side, we see very national uh, politics, which would mean that solidarity on a global level is actually decreasing. So I'm not so sure. I am hopeful, though, that by uh, if governments adapt the idea of taking social prosperity seriously in their in their um, goals, um, then we can make progress in these areas. Thank you, Katharina. So let me now turn to you. Uh, Augustine. So I think uh, your policy brief was probably the, the best suited to really tackle the, the, the main theme of this session, so reducing wealth gap. So can you tell us uh, more specifically how you think your proposal uh, can help really reduce wealth gaps and uh, uh, the extent to which this is beneficial for society? Yeah, thanks Gianluca. Yeah, so, uh, you know, inequality, when we talk about inequality, and that's actually what we did in our policy brief, we often focus on income inequality, and we kind of mm, overlook a bit wealth 
inequality, the concentration of wealth, which is crucial. Um, and, and one of the reasons is that the data on wealth is um, are much scarcer and more inaccurate than income data, probably. Uh, that might be one of the reasons. But in any case, where there is evidence and the great job that um, Piketty and others are doing in, with their lab, inequality lab, where they also have a time series of concentration of wealth, um, is a case in point where the evidence is out there. What we find is that actually inequality is even um, much more of an issue when we take into account the concentration of wealth or the distribution of wealth, right? So um, certainly uh, there are different drivers of wealth inequality. And I think in most of these drivers, tax expenditures do play a role. Let me just give you three that I just can uh, think of. Uh, obviously there is a correlation between the concentration of income and concentration of wealth. So of wealth, so the, the the role of effective tax rates, and when we, when I talk about effective tax rates, uh, inside the equation to come up with the effective tax rate, we already I, I are are talking about tax expenditures, so we refer to tax expenditures, right? Because the the what what gives the effective tax rate is actually statutory tax rate minus all the deductions, tax credits, and tax expenditures that we can think of. So the effective tax rates for top income earners have substantially declined in the recent decades all over the world. Uh, but that's also the case for effective tax rates when it comes to corporate income and estate or inherit inheritance taxes that have disproportionately benefited top income groups. Again, the work of Piketty and Sires, for instance, in this area, it, it is seminal. Uh, and the third, mechanism or driver of wealth inequality where I think tax penetration play a role is tax evasion and tax avoidance, right? Uh, again, there, Zuckman and others have already shown that tax evasion rises significantly and sharply with wealth. Um, and, and we know that tax loopholes, different opportunities to avoid um, and today or these coming days, last days uh, with the US uh, debate uh, that was out in the media, uh, we know that tax avoidance, tax evasion, tax um, aggressive tax planning has a crucial role uh, in, in, in the, the concentration of inequality, either income or wealth. And again, there, uh, if we want to mitigate inequality, tackling tax avoidance, tackling tax evasion seriously, and hence reducing the loopholes that are present in tax systems, it's a, it's a crucial um, policy that G20 leaders should um, be pursuing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we, um, according to my watch, we would still have uh, two minutes uh, uh, for our panel, but since I think we are a little bit um, ahead of the schedule, so maybe we can have time for another uh, round of um, uh, questions. So, um, yeah, I have a very simple question for Katerina. So how how close do you think we are to going beyond the GDP? And um, um, and also a question to you, but also to Agustin, so you, you can share it uh, in a way. So what is uh, actually the, the cost of uh, raising the data that we need to uh, construct the, the dashboard or, or construct these uh, analyses? Uh, of uh, the impact of uh, tax expenditures because uh, of course uh, data are and information uh, that is not freely available um, governments should uh, invest uh, into that and maybe there is also a role for the g20 to have a kind of a common pool of uh, knowledge and of uh, analysis and maybe also of uh, financial commitments in order to uh, make uh, the gathering of uh, uh, the data that are needed available. If so, I may, uh, I start. Um, uh, so I think uh, we are on our way to move beyond GDP, um, but uh, there are many initiatives and uh, different GDP alternatives have been proposed but none of them have really picked up. So we see some countries who, who are making some efforts, 
but uh, we still lack an um, collective effort to, to really take uh, social development, for example, seriously and measure this in a unified um, way. And this is where, 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 the, where our dashboard comes into play. So we wanted to design a simple uh, tool. So this is where we have four categories. Um, we root our framework in an empirical and interdisciplinary understanding of human well being and uh, develop these metrics for generating insights into how different policies, institutional arrangements, and political ideologies yield different outcomes for the citizens and the planet um, we live on. Um, and I think this differentiates, so the, the, the foundation differentiates it from, from other metrics. Um, when you think about data collection, um, we, I think the cost for the G20, for example, pushing forward in, um, in uh, collecting data for, for the dashboard is actually very low because we rely on um, indicators that are already out there. We rely on objective and subjective measures from surveys. And um, I, so governments need to take the opportunity of this dashboard. I would suggest that governments should take the opportunity of this dashboard um, that is out there. Most of the data is available. Um, um, so it wouldn't cost too much and it would make a difference. And as we show um, in, in the policy brief, for example, um, it has an impact on, on the society. So I think uh, we are not yet there and there's a long way to go, but um, if the G20 takes up um, this proposal, we could make a big step towards uh, measuring more um, holistic and uh, um, overall welfare of uh, societies. Yeah, thank you, Katharina. Um, Agustin. Yeah, you know, I totally agree. I mean, transparency and availability of data is a, is a crucial issue in, in, in this topic. And we um, have been pushing uh, the G20 to improve um, transparency regarding tax expenditure reporting uh, since three or four years, since the German presidency of the G20 already, with different policy briefs. Unfortunately, the reception has not been the expected one. Um, but, you know, the, the, it's particularly streaky in the opacity in the tax expenditure area. That's why the first stage of our policy recommendation here is simply to estimate and report on tax expenditure, right? We, there, it's unacceptable that governments do not provide information on how much money, how much taxpayers' money they are using through the implementation of these provisions. So this said, when governments um, use the lack of data as a justification to the lack of impact evaluation, so cost-benefit analysis, which is often the case, this is even more striking because the data is not lacking. The data is there. Governments sit on data, right? As long as governments collect taxes and taxpayers file tax returns, uh, governments do have access to the data. What is missing in some, kind, in some cases like poor countries is the capacity to process that data in G20 uh, uh, countries case, is not uh, that much a lack of capacity of res or resources, but probably a lack, of, uh, a lack of political will. So in any case, the data, the, all the raw material to trigger, to generate the data is, is there. Uh, what we are missing is that step that allow us to, 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 to make that data available and use it for, uh, event, again, cost benefit analysis, impact evaluation, and you know, and to at the end of the day, what we are looking for, and I think we, we all agree, is that policy making is evidence based, right? That means that we need that data to play a role in the in the policy making decision. Thank you, thank you very much uh, to both Katharina and Agustin. I think we have uh, exceeded uh, our uh, time, and uh, well, we know that the T20 is uh, the so-called uh, ideas bank for the G20. So uh, we only have to hope that uh, the G20 will dip into our policy briefs and uh, will implement uh, the ideas that we think uh, are desirable for a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Gianluca. Thank you, Gianluca.
much, Dr. Gianluca uh, and uh, Augustine and Katerina for this insightful discussion. Uh, now, now we're moving to the uh, final panel discussion and uh, it will be about investing in social mobility, uh, moderated by the lead co-chair, Dr. Suzanne uh, Garcia. Uh, okay, thank you, Nguyen. Uh, well, up, uplifting the socioeconomic uh, status of future, uh, future uh, citizens will guarantee a peaceful society that coexists with the government and leads to overall growth of a nation. The last today, focus, uh, the, our last panel today focuses on investing in social mobility. We start with uh, Matthias Urban, Professor, dismissed uh, Chair of Early Childhood Education, Early Childhood Research Centers, uh, Diplin City University. The floor is yours, Matthias. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And uh, a very good afternoon to everybody from Dublin, Ireland. Um, before I, I go into this, uh, I would like to follow my, um, uh, the previous speakers and just thank the uh, co-chairs of this task force, Suzanne and her co-chairs, but also Hanin uh, for their relentless work behind the scenes and guiding us to uh, actually su successfully producing this impressive um, ar uh, array of policy briefs. I would also like to say that our policy brief uh, focuses on the, um, the potential of community-based integrated early childhood development, education and care um, services to uh, uh, address inequality and foster social cohesion. It's a collective work. And just to briefly acknowledge the group of co-authors, um, Alejandro Cadini from CPEC in um, uh, Argentina, Claudia Costin from the Center for Excellence and in, in, uh, in Innovation in Education Policies in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Rita Flores Romero from the National University of Colombia in Bogota, uh, Jennifer Guevara from uh, uh, CPEC, but now working with us in Dublin at the Research Center, Lineto Kengo uh, from the African Early Childhood Network based in Nairobi, Kenya, and Tui Briono from the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization and the Center for Early Childhood in Jakarta. Um, the premise for our policy brief really is the, a global consensus about the importance of um, early childhood development, early child education and care, which is manifest not least in the inclusion um, uh, of early childhood in the um, SDG framework, specifically SDG uh, 4.2. But we also, uh, um, while progress is being made, we're also experiencing persistent inequalities uh, in terms of access and, uh, and quality services for children and families and communities, inequalities between countries, but arguably more significantly, uh, significantly inequalities within countries. Um, in the current um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we also uh, experience the question of how resilient early childhood systems are. Uh, in, uh, uh, in many countries, we've seen early childhood systems, support systems for children and families collapse. And again, this leads us to arguing the, uh, the importance of community involvement, community-based solutions, and uh, the connection to um, national overarching frameworks. Um, the emphasis of our policy brief um, is on the importance of universal policy frameworks that enable locally and culturally appropriate um, solutions. We talk about competent systems and we um, start um, our um, suggestion of possible policy choices um, that are available to, to policymakers with um, a, um, a commitment to um, some key elements. They are sustainability, social cohesion, systems resilience in times of crisis and disruption, and 
that leads us to identifying a range of policy choices that we think are available to um, policymakers and decision makers. And the first one is really about acknowledging social cohesion as a declared, declared goal of national early childhood policies. Um, the second one is about um, ensuring that comprehensive early childhood development and early childhood education and care services are responsive to the uh, capabilities and the needs of communities. And the third one is about combining uh, central guidance, central frameworks, central funding and resourcing with strong and autonomous local democratic structures. The two uh, go together. The fourth of policy choice that we identify and uh, uh, suggest to the G20 is about the importance of initiating national debate about the purpose and the aspiration associated with comprehensive early childhood education and early childhood development programs. Why are we as a society uh, investing um, in these activities? And the fifth um, um, uh, arena, the fifth uh, sort of um, policy choice is about the importance um, of establishing um, monitoring and evaluation and data collection systems that ensure that all stakeholders are heard in a continuous process of developing the quality of these uh, integrated community-based early childhood development, education and care services. So we're talking about children, families, community leaders, practitioners, and we heard about the importance of data in the previous presentations. So really in a nutshell, what we're, what we're arguing for is um, um, the importance of integration and coordination. So there is a responsibility of governments, and this is why we think the G20 is ideally placed to put this on the agenda uh, for the G20 countries. And uh, it is about um, moving the focus from sort of a service and business uh, and mindset to a mindset of common good and state and government responsibility. Okay, thank you, Matthias. Ready. We will go uh, uh, now to uh, our second uh, panelist in, in, the, in the panel. Uh, Florencia Cario uh, She's uh, a social uh, protection program in a social protection program coordinator project uh, coordinators, and uh, this is the center for the implica uh, implementation of public policies for equity and growth. City, the floor is yours, Florencia. Well, I can't see uh, uh, Margo. Margo, she's Hi. with us in this. Yes, I'm here, you. so oh, go okay, ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay, okay. Good yeah, there. See. I just okay. have to fix my camera. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, uh -huh. The floor is yours, uh, Florencia. Okay, thank you very much, Susan, and thank you to all the co chairs and to Hanin as well. And good morning here for everybody. Our policy brief addresses global care chains, and it has involved the work of uh, Margot Thomas, who will speak after, Peter Abramson, Maria Babovic, Asma Baharmas. Alejandro Biondi, I'm Juan Bruzaman, and I will now summarize our main points on our policy recommendations. The COVID-19 crisis and built a fact that remain mostly unspoken in the public debate, that is that care work is essential for sustainable life as we know it. Care and domestic work, whether paid or unpaid, it encompasses diverse activities, such as cooking, cleaning, shopping, teaching, caring for children, the sick or the elderly. It involves the essential healthcare systems, but also domestic work, cleaning services, and the unpaid care labor undertaken by families and communities. Globally, we see that care and domestic work, both paid and unpaid, falls disproportionately on women, who perform 76% of the total work. This reduces their time available for work, education, or leisure. Yet among, yet among women, inequalities also exist because it is the poorer ones who bear a heavy burden of unpaid work. During the last 50 years, we have seen that women have massively entered the labor force, but men have not increased their part in care work. Therefore, households have increasingly relied on hiring other people, usually, usually other women, to do this course. And in, in an integrated world, this has fueled a global care chain in which poor women migrate across borders to provide care. 
Global color chains involve unskilled labor occurring in households and skill activities such as healthcare systems and healthcare provision. There are the nurses, the doctors, the domestic workers, and the caregivers. Migrant care workers face intersecting struggles related to migration, care, class, class ethnicity, and gender, among others. And as care is feminized, this has clear implications for gender equality. First, we know that many migrants care workers are in irregular status. This reduces their access to social and legal protection. Currently, we know that to address the pandemic, many countries around the world have implemented measures to mitigate its socioeconomic consequences. Yet these migrants cannot benefit from such policies, which include relief packages, cash transfers, and unemployment or health insurance. Many countries, even if they do have documentation, migrant care workers often work in the informal economy and receive low wages, and they are not covered by the general labor regime. Migrant care workers are usually women who migrate by themselves, leaving their family in their home country. Thus, they might be especially affected by mobility restrictions or border closures underway. Many months after the outburst of the emergency, most countries have limited family reunification schemes. What we see is that global care chains depicted challenges before this crisis, which are now increased. The pandemic removed the cloak on how vital the care economy is. To build longer term resilience of communities and societies, to achieve better social cohesion, we need to guarantee social protection floors for all, and we need to rethink the implicit gender dynamics of care and how this intersects with class, poverty, ethnicity, and other inequalities. The G20 has a responsibility and the capability to advance policies on global care chains and guarantee migrant workers' rights. First, G20 countries must provide documentation on social protection while also promoting legal frameworks that allow all migrants to claim their rights as workers, regardless of their situation. Second, the G20 must foster the adoption of the 5R framework, a rights-based and gender-sensitive approach to care policy that aims at recognizing, reducing, and redistributing care work, rewarding care workers, and guaranteeing their representation. Third, the group of 20 must adhere to international treaties that promote rights-based support strategies for migrants. This way, they can promote better livelihoods, safe migration procedures, decent work opportunities, and ensure family reunification if needed. This also requires fostering policy coherence between migration, employment, and sectoral regimes, as well as strengthening law enforcement. Fourth, the G20 should improve data collection and care and support research on the topic, which can be achieved by deepening cooperation with G20 engagement groups. This could inform decision making and promote implementation of more evidence based policies. Also, the group should facilitate exchanges among members to ensure an overall coherent strategy on care chains and implement peer learning mechanisms. This could involve the development working group and other spaces for joint work across tracks and working groups. Finally, it is also imperative for the G20 to mainstream gender in all tracks, discussions, and groups. This can create an environment that fosters coherence in tackling global care chains and other relevant issues, and it also ensures that commitments are gender sensitive throughout the subsequent G20 presidency. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was uh, an interesting perspective on women empowerment at the grassroots uh, root levels. Thank you so much. We go to our uh, our uh, final uh, panelist, uh, Margo Thomas, uh, founder and chief, exec uh, chief executive uh, officer, Women's Economic Imperative. The floor is yours, uh, Margo. Thank you very much, Susan. Can you hear me? Yes, we are. we are. Okay, wonderful. Sorry, and I apologize if there is any background noise. I have two macaws right outside my door, and sometimes they have very no, no, strong no, no. We views. We don't hear anything. We don't <laughs> only your voice. Uh, um, so I, I first of all would like to thank you, Susan, for your leadership of this uh, task force and um, for the support that you've provided to the various panels and, and policy brief authors in, in bringing forth quality policy briefs. Um, I would like to support some of the points made by Carolique, by Florencia, but to emphasize two things, I think. It, it comes across, but I, I really just want to emphasize this. We talk about um, the risks to which migrant uh, care workers are exposed. And I think 
we know that in some situations there's an active recruitment, but much of this is done informally. So as we think of how to address these, these issues, I think one needs to start with the formalization of the processes and ensuring that there are regulations through which the recruiters and the employers and the employees, their rights can be established and safeguarded. I think that, that adoption of those processes and policies across the G20 could in fact lay some of the foundation for addressing many of the other issues that, that have been uh, raised in the policy brief. The second point there is that it could also lead to the professionalization um, of these workers. Uh, recruiters could be tasked with certifying and providing basic training. That in itself improves the quality of care and the consistency of care, but also allows for education or about rights and the legal frameworks under which these uh, care workers are expected to work. So there needs to be work on, my, I guess my point is there needs to be work on both sides of the equation, if from the country source countries, but also the destination countries. And this is where I think the G20 is unique in its composition because it, its members constitute both ends of that equation um, and certainly have a leadership role for the countries that are not members of the G20. So I, I really would like to emphasize this because we need to think in terms of pragmatic steps that need to be taken. And I think this would um, be a very good basic way of implementing some of the ILO initiatives in a very practical and pragmatic way. Second point that I would like to raise and final point is around data collection. I don't think we can say it enough. There is a paucity of data. And if we cannot track these things, we need to be more inventive in how we collect the data and aim to get greater consistence, consistency because that would feed the policy making um, and, and that's essential. I'll stop there for now. Okay, thank you. Well I will. I have one uh, one question to you and uh, and Florencia before I go back to Matthias. Uh, so, what what measures should uh, G20 nations take to ensure universally recognized uh, documentations of migrant uh, workers, uh, ensure works uh, uh, worker rights, uh, continuous funding in, in in social mobility? What do you think, Ma Margot and Florencia? Uh, Florencia, do you want to take a stab at it, or do you want me to go first? Yeah, you can one okay. by one. You okay, can. I, I, like I said, I, I, that's precisely why I, I made the two points I just made, because we know that, and I, I don't have the statistics, but I, I would posit that at least fifty percent of the um, employment of these migrant care workers is done informally. There's no regulation of it, yet. There, there needs to be a way in which the, the receiving country governments start to document these, these workers and encourage or incentivize the hiring families to declare these workers. I think that has to be a starting point. Um, and, and there needs to be greater moral fortitude around this issue. In some economies, everybody is doing it and yet nobody's talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where I think the force of government will become essential, but that to my mind is a first step. To add to what Margot was saying, we need to address the fact of documentation, but also the fact that even some migrant care workers who have documentation lack like labor rights at all because they are not covered by the general labor regime. So for example, we know that in Asian and Pacific countries, 61% of domestic workers lack legal protection. And we know that in the Middle East, in some countries, this percentage rises to 99%. So we really need countries to address this. First, for example, for the case of domestic workers who are the most vulnerable in this context, there's the ILO convention number, uh, 
189, I think, a recommendation 201 that both try to extend fundamental rights to domestic markets, but only 30 countries around the world have ratified it. So we need that the G20 commits to ratify these conventions and advance in promoting rights for all. Okay, thank you. I'll go back to you, Matthew. It's a, like it comes to my mind yesterday when I was preparing to our panel. So, what is the impact of technology on early childhood for grants? Especially, you are an expert in this uh, in this area. Uh, we can't hear you, Matthew. Sorry, I'm still learning. Um, with the question of technology, I think hit us all in when um, they, when countries were confronted with their, their COVID crisis. One of the things that I think we all saw is that uh, countries put an enormous effort into uh, moving education across the board from uh, from uh, presence to to online. Um, what we have to acknowledge is that this gets incredibly difficult when it comes to to the youngest children. There's hardly a meaningful way to provide um, early childhood education um, online only. So uh, the, the big question in, in relation to technology is, is not so much um, how much can we sort of um, move early childhood uh, into the sort of um, um, the, the virtual space, but how can we use technology to support um, early childhood systems in times of disruption and crisis. And, and this is uh, where we see huge differences between countries. And I think this is where the G20 provides an, a, an, an enormous opportunity for shared learning uh, between countries. What we do see is that countries that don't have monitoring systems, countries that rely heavily on fragmented, um, quite often private for profit, profit provision, um, um, rapidly lo lose track of what's happening they lose track of what the children are and they're and they're in, in in very difficult situations when it comes to providing continued support we see other countries who have adopted um highly integrated um, early childhood development uh, education and care policy frameworks including the kind of the type of monitoring and data collections uh, uh, systems that we recommend in our policy brief these countries um, can rely on um, um, their use of data, their use of um, technology to provide support to communities and families, even when center-based provision um, is closed. And, and we, we see examples for that, for, in, for instance, in Colombia, in, in, in South America, but also in, in a, number of, a number of other countries. In contrast, Countries like um, the one that I'm uh, speaking to you uh, from today, Ireland, but also um, largely the uh, the US, um, and this, the system has um, basically collapsed. So the question of technology in relation to young children is really a systems question, is not so much a, a question of providing uh, content to uh, children and families and uh, while centers are closed. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, oh, I have a question for all of you, if you don't mind, in, in one to two lines, how would you sum up the most important takeaway from your policy briefs for the leaders? Uh, we start with you, uh, Margo. For me, I, I see a, a recurring theme. I listened in on some of the other policy briefs. And I, I really think it's um, in light of the current uh, geopolitical uh, situation and the COVID-19 pandemic and the way in which uh, human beings are impacted, I really do think we need to return to human-centered um, policy conception and implementation. I think we've kind of moved away from that. And this is the essence of, from a social cohesion perspective, why we continue to see these disparities and the social and political upheavals or, or incidences that are roiling across the world as we try to grapple with the environmental and the health shocks. 
that are having significant economic impacts. Um, so whether you're talking about education, you're talking about health, you're talking about labor, um, we really need to go back to some or to reaffirm those essential core values around the integrity of and value of every human being and use that as part of the resetting. Um, and this is where I think that the G20 must play an important role, if only in its own self-interest, because the uh, concept of mutual vulnerabilities, I think the pandemic has made abundantly clear to each and every one of us at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, Florencia? I agree with what Margot was saying. And in this vein, I also think that today it's really clear the role of care. We all see it every day, everywhere. And now we need to value care. We need to stop making it statistically invisible. And I think the G20 has a really important role there because some countries have made progress on these issues. So there's a space to create joint work and create these parallel mechanisms in order to advance jointly on how to re-engineer GDP, for example. GDP today in most countries does not account for unpaid care work, but we know that in some countries, estimations have calculated that it goes up to 16 or even 20% of the total GDP. So we need to value, we need to recognize the importance of care. And in this line, we need to advance for rights for both care workers and for those that receive care to make sure that it is quality care. Thank you. Uh, Matthias, we go to you now. Well, I suppose the, uh, the take, take home message really is about the importance of integrated, coordinated and multilateral um, um, approaches and the G20 provides the forum uh, that has the potential to actually um, provide this. It also, uh, I think, is a, a key message that um, we need to be much more um, alert or much more aware of um, approaches and successful approaches by, um, uh, taken by countries in, in times of crisis and disruption. Um, and to initiate these sort of global south north south 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 north um, collaborations because um what we see for instance in in uh, in, in, the, in the bigger picture of sort of countries addressing um, covid 19 we see um, that countries for instance in the global south in 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 a number of african countries are doing so much better than uh, countries in in the global north so um, integration, coordination, um, and multilateral solutions. This is why uh, the, the G20 sort of is the forum. And I think this, the, the, the final take home message is really about um, a shift of thinking that um, um, there is an important responsibility of governments to promote and initiate uh, development of the common good and uh, we've been talking about this in relation to young children and their families and communities but um, it is something that I think um, uh, is important across the whole range of policy briefs that we've produced in this uh, task force. Oh, thank you so much and uh, it was really my pleasure to work with all of you, I mean uh, all authors and uh, co-chairs, I want to thank uh, to all the participating authors for your recommendations, uh, urging the G20 leadership to work to forward uh, social harmony. Hopefully, um, I want to uh, I want thank I want to thank the audience for all over the world. Special thank for my colleagues from uh, uh, King Abdulaziz University who took the time out from their schedule to join us. Thank you, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the moderators and uh, uh, go back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Suzanne, and also thank you for everyone. Uh, and now we're moving to the uh, economy perspective and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Carlos Kitschi, the Vice President uh, of the Italian Institute for International Political Studies. Um, Carlo, uh, floor is yours. 
Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if I understood well, it is my turn uh, to say a few words. Uh, I hope uh, you can hear me well, notwithstanding some technical problems before. And first of all, uh, let me say that I'm very grateful for the invitation to listen to this very, very interesting webinar of today organized uh, by the task for, force for on social cohesion and the state. A very, very important topic. And consequently, my thanks to, on behalf also of the Italian Institute for International Political Studies, ISPI, to the Secretariat of the Saudi T20, and in particular to Dr. Fahad Al Turki, Chair of the Saudi T20, and to Kari, who has been co-organizing co this webinar of today, which proved to be so efficiently set up and, and carried out. Covering some very, very important things. Of course, uh, social cohesion is uh, something which is becoming increasingly important nowadays because of the fact that the situation has been aggravated by the pandemic crisis, by the COVID crisis and its repercussions on the economy and on societies at the world level in each individual country or almost I should say. And consequently the questions posed for a renewed, strengthened, enhanced role of the state at the national level, but also within international cooperation fora, such as the G20. And as you know, next year it will be the turn of Italy to, to, to hold the presidency of the G20, and ISPI will be the organizer of the T20 uh, activities. And consequently, what it was possible for me to, to listen to uh, today is very important because uh, it covers uh, most uh, uh, problems which will be again at the center of our attention in the near future, not only because of the crisis, of course, reinforced by the crisis, this need, but also because these problems, these issues have been at the center of Italian public opinion and political debate. And consequently, the Italian government, I'm sure, will do its best in order to keep them on the agenda and to give them all necessary attention in next year's activity. So continuity will be one of our catchwords and we will draw very much from the experience learned through the T20 under Saudi organization. But it is not only something of high interest to Italy and to the Italian government, but also at the European level. You know that uh, Recently, the heads of state and uh, have approved a very ambitious resilience and recovery fund, which is supposed not only to uh, give support to the restarting of the European economy, if I may say so, but also at the same time to cope with some of the most important problems both in the field of the environment uh, and all related issues and in the social field. So the European economy, according to this plan, not only needs to be more sustainable, but also to reinforce its competitiveness and these chances of growth in the future to the benefit of the future generations in particular. And as a matter of fact, as you all know, this plan, Resilience and Recovery Fund, is known as Next Generation EU. 
So this is really a clear message which is being launched. But not only this plan is under implementation, almost under implementation, but other measures have been taken to cope with the more urgent social problems caused by the crisis, by the COVID induced social and economic crisis. Allow me just to, to remind the so-called SURE fund meant to support workers who have been either laid off their work or have been encountering big problems because of their, because of their company's problems, as well as special funds being made available to cope with health problems like the possibility to use the so-called uh, European mechanism for state support. So all you've been talking about today, not only belongs to, allow me to call it a tradition of political debate uh, in Italy, but not only in Italy, at the European level as well, but is made even more urgent in this very moment because of the economic and social crisis caused by the COVID pandemic. So we will make uh, good use of the results of this webinar, of the papers presented, presented of the very interesting uh, suggestions included in the different policy briefs, as well as uh, of the results and policy briefs produced by other task forces. And of course, you will be with us again next year. And we hope all together to be able to carry out a useful work, useful for improving a situation which indeed needs a reinforced, a renewed, in some, in some cases, drastically changed to the better direction effort by the public sector, by the state, and by the states at the international level. Thank you very much again for your attention. And again, my renewed congratulations for this excellent webinar we have been able to attend this afternoon. Thank you so much, Carlo. Um, and now I would like to invite Dr. Fahad Turkey, the chair of T20 Saudi Arabia and the vice president um, of King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center. Dr. Fahad, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Hanin. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Suzanne, for uh, a well-organized uh, webinar uh, on task force number four, the closing of task number uh, task force four, but definitely uh, not yet closing many of the issues that are being uh, discussed uh, today. Um, it's uh, it's a, a great honor uh, to listen to um, to the panelists, uh, to the issues that are being discussed. Uh, to the policy briefs uh, that have been uh, submitted uh, and published uh, in, in the website in, in, in Saudi Arabia for, uh, of T20 Saudi Arabia for a very important topic uh, as that social cohesion of social societies lay the foundation uh, for um, healthy states. Uh, our inspiration when we started uh, this um, uh, task force was to reduce, to provide policy recommendations to reduce global inequalities. In the face now, uh, as we entered into COVID-19 in the face of, healthy, of uh, health crisis, through maintaining access to education as well as economic opportunities uh, for um, minorities. But the fact in the ground is that inequality um, within and across nations, as many of you mentioned today, erodes the social fabric. Uh, and I'm delighted to see some of the practical recommendations in the policy briefs that will be highlighted uh, to the G20 leaders during their summit 
in uh, in November. Um, definitely, many of these recommendations will uh, will, especially the practical uh, ones, will be uh, will be highlighted in the T20 communique Saudi Arabia, which is now being uh, drafted. Uh, of course, inequality um, and uh, and the GDP uh, of countries uh, or measuring inequality uh, lacks many aspects, and there are so many uh, uh, reservations. Uh, but definitely, we always in in the look to develop uh, uh, better measures uh, of these indicators, uh, as as understanding the problem is uh, is halfway getting. Uh, to the solution and the right policy and practical uh, policy recommendations. Um, definitely, we will only push uh, the recommendations that are um, practical uh, and will benefit uh, the whole world uh, and, and solve uh, the global challenges. But definitely, on this task force, there are global challenges which also require uh, local responses as many highlighted in their uh, in their policy briefs including leveraging ngos and faith based organizations uh, as well as empowering local governance uh, to enable social innovation uh, and in the world of the um, covid-19 there is a growing uh, need uh, to to improve the physical response uh, to target uh, COVID uh, reliefs, including equitable and effective uh, taxation. Some of the other recommendations that are being highlighted in the panels today is larger role for elderly population in a well-functioning society, uh, which is uh, an important uh, aspect, universal and as well as universal basic income. Um, I. Definitely, uh, these are some of my uh, notes that I've taken while while I was listening to to the four panels. Uh, uh, but uh, and also as I am reading the policy briefs, but I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the T20 Secretariat um, to thank uh, the lead co-chair, uh, Dr. Suzanne, for her. Uh, Tremendous effort throughout uh, throughout the year, as well as Hanin for the coordination of the task force, uh, and definitely a special thanks to our uh, co-chairs of the task force uh, who were um, uh, very generous with us in terms of their time, uh, as well as providing uh, the the recommendation as well as adapting to the new norm and shifting from the in-person meetings to the virtual world and adapting the new reality into the policy briefs within a very short of, um, of time. I'm not surprised uh, because many, many of you are well known in within, within their, uh, their field. I would like to also thank uh, the authors of the policy briefs as well as the members of the task force uh, for their continuous support and contribution uh, into uh, uh, different uh, webinars uh, that enriched uh, the discussion. Uh, the reviewers in CAPSARC and KF Chris, the, uh, uh, the peer review that took uh, uh, the policy briefs on the first phase on the second phase are also uh, appreciated. Uh, as a T20 Secretariat, I would like also to thank uh, our leading institution or co-leading institution for their continuous support, for without them and their financial and also organizational support, we wouldn't been uh, in, uh, in such a very good shape. And that is that special thanks goes to CAPSARC and KF Chris. Uh, of course, uh, CARI and, uh, and SP uh, are uh, our partners um, uh, today, uh, and we would like to thank them for their, uh, their contribution. Um, this is, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, the, the conclusion that I would, I would like to, uh, to conclude with. 
but I would like to remind everybody today that we are um, not yet uh, uh, finished with the summit season. We have converted the, two, the usual two-day summit in T20 to almost five-week uh, summit uh, because of the new norm rather than shorting, uh, shortening uh, our events, we decided to expand the time and give everybody an opportunity uh, to present uh, the, the work, the hard work that was done over, uh, over the year. So we started in September 17th, uh, our summit season, dedicating one day per task force. Uh, and today is task force four. Uh, next, we will have Task Force 5 on Economic um, Economy, Employment, Education in the Digital Age on October uh, 6th. So I invite you all to, to attend as that is also part of the T20 Summit. And we will conclude on the two-day uh, flagship event, which is in uh, November, October 31st and November 1st. Um, and then probably we will have another handover event to our Italian colleagues at the end of November. Um, so there are still many events and many activity to come uh, for the T20 Saudi Arabia and for the T20 global community. So I continue to invite you to, um, to participate in all of these. Thank you very much and have a great day and see you next Tuesday on the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, bye-bye. <laughs> and this is going to conclude the uh, webinar for Task Force 4. Thank you all for attending and uh, bye. <laughs>